Think quick, when I say female icon, who comes to mind? Well, before Beyonce, before Lady Gaga, way before even Madonna, there was Josephine Baker, 1920s music hall star, anti-Nazi wartime spy, mother of the Rainbow Tribe, civil rights activist, and all-around pop icon. And like these other later female leaders, Josephine pushed the envelope and attracted attention, adored by many, reviled by some, ignored by none. Never heard of her? About time that you did. Stick around to learn more about this extraordinary woman and her life during a time that transformed her birth country, the United States, and her adopted country, France. <laughs> Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of AP Euroblast and our series, Black Lives in European History. I'm Philippe Seiler, and as always, I'm here to spark your interest in European history, activate your memory, and make connections. Josephine Baker's public life began in 1925 when she came to France at the age of 19, but as always, we need context, so let's start at the beginning. First, the personal stuff. Freda Josephine MacDonald was born in St. Louis on June 3rd, 1906. Her personal circumstances were, to say the least, very hard. Her birth mother was a washerwoman. Her father is unknown. There are various theories about him. And Josephine was adopted and raised by two former slaves. We don't know much about her early life, but when she was only 11 years old, there was a massive race massacre across the river in East St. Louis, Illinois. This massacre left between 40 and 200 black people dead. Several thousand were left homeless, and many of them crossed over the bridge into St. Louis, Missouri. Understandably, Josephine sought to escape this world from a very young age, and there were two ways that she tried to do that. First of all, marriage was her first escape, first at age 13, later at age 15. And from her second marriage, she got her surname Baker. And this led to her second escape, which was the stage. And since she became famous with the name Baker, she kept it for the rest of her life, even though that marriage didn't last very long either. Now, we do need some context about theater in the United States, because we can't really understand Josephine's life without it. Now, black theater was already really well established as a tradition in the United States by the time of Josephine's birth. And it was growing and changing. Already by the 1880s, black entertainment for black audiences had become a formal industry with circuit tours in the South and in parts of the Midwest. Vaudeville, or variety shows, featured singing, dancing, acting, and had a heavy emphasis on physical comedy and showy spectacle. White audiences also loved vaudeville, but they were only comfortable seeing black people as caricatures of themselves and only then if they're portrayed by white people who are using blackface. This was beginning to change slightly during Josephine's early life. This Bahamian-born actor, Burt Williams, was the only black actor to be part of the incredibly successful Ziegfeld Follies. And by 1910, he was its actual highest paid star. Bizarrely, he too used blackface to present a caricaturized version of black people. But then again, maybe this isn't so strange because white audiences were very uncomfortable at seeing African Americans as normal people. A bigger breakthrough for black theater came in 1921 with the production of Shuffle Along. It also turned out to be a bridge to stardom for Josephine. Now recently, 2016, the show was the focus of a critically acclaimed Broadway musical, and so it has stayed culturally relevant in our time. The original production, however, reflects the time in which it was made, and it's full of painful stereotypes uh, and colorism, including blackface. But it did achieve a few things that no previous work ever had. First, it was an all-black production, not just its cast, but uh, the composition by the songwriting team of Noble Sissel and Yubi Blake. Second, it's a major success with white audiences, running for over a year, which by the standard of the day is like a really long time. Third, it brings jazz to Broadway for the very first time. But with sad, ironic timing, it also uh, happens during an outbreak of horrific violence against African Americans. The same week that the show opens, there is the Tulsa race massacre that destroys Black Wall Street and countless black lives in Oklahoma. So Shuffle Along 
furthermore launches the career of some major African-American singers and actors, such as Adelaide Hall, Florence Mills, Freddie Washington, and Paul Robeson. And one of the musicians who's in the orchestra, William Grant Still, is going to go on to become critically and commercially acclaimed as a composer. And finally, Shuffle Along is usually seen as the beginning of the Harlem Renaissance, which is a major intellectual and artistic chapter in American history. All this is fascinating, right? I know, but we'll have to learn more somewhere else because we have to get on to Josephine. Well, she was only 15 when she joined Shuffle Along, and she barely made the cut after several auditions. She's considered too small and not pretty enough for anything beyond the chorus line. Her comedic acting, however, and her dancing were good enough that she attracted the attention uh, for a, another review show, La Revue Negre, which was going to be opening in Paris. And she was not only chosen, but she was chosen for the lead role in that. So in late 1925, along with 19 other dancers and musicians, Josephine boarded a steamship for France. And they developed and they rehearsed uh, the show on their way across the Atlantic. And within a matter of weeks, at the age of 19, Josephine would be an international star. Okay, I don't want to ignore or try to explain away the obvious racism of these posters here that promoted La Revue Negre. But I don't want to dwell on the racism either, since our focus really should be on Josephine and the impacts she was going to make on Paris and the rest of France. Paris went wild for Josephine and for all things black, even if this meant over-exoticizing a world that was foreign to most Parisians. She almost immediately starts selling out well-known venues like the Folie Berger. Influential French, European, and expat Americans uh, flock to her shows, and they write and they speak effusively about La Becker and helped her legend to grow. Now, the French poster artist, Paul Collin, in addition to the promotional poster that we saw a moment ago, made his own breakthrough with a collection of lithographs, which he called La Tumulte Noire. And this is an apt phrase, the black tumult, for the fetishizing madness that seizes the city of light. And Josephine loved Paris right back. When the rest of the crew for the Revue Negre returned to New York, Josephine stayed behind. And she perceived racism, certainly in Paris, on the one hand, but on the other hand, she didn't seem to mind participating in the fetishization of black culture. There was a sort of balance between the voyeurism of Paris audiences and Josephine's own exhibitionism and desire to be seen. So what was it about Josephine that captivated Parisian audiences so? Well, partly it's her personal magnetism. Now, vaudeville has always been about you know, exaggeration and extravagance, but Josephine brings those even to a new level. Uh, probably because she'd been thought of as being too small and not pretty enough, uh, this pushed her right over the top to get at attention, to get noticed. And we can see this in her costumes, right? They're deliberately provocative and sexually suggestive. So to take a look at a couple, the most well-known of hers uh, consisted of little else than silk bananas, uh, which flapped with her raunchy movements. And there's another costume, which was essentially a set of pink ostrich feathers that barely covered her at all. Now, Josephine pairs her outrageous garments with a personality on and off stage that's completely free of inhibition and exudes self-confidence. She woos audiences with a frenzied version of the Charleston and a final number that was known as the Danse Sauvage, which can be translated as wild dance, but with the clear implication that the dancers themselves are savage. Now, she further endears herself to Paris audiences with her winsome smile and with her self-deprecating sense of comedy. It includes crossing her eyes and making all sorts of other facial contortions and, and grimaces. Okay, and now the deeper stuff. And yes, you knew it was coming. More contextualization. And the experience of empire leads to contradictory impulses on the part of the French and the self-assured superiority of the colonizing power alternating between need to uh, exploit and need to protect also runs up against a completely different impulse, which is to see in colonized people the actual spiritual and cultural salvation and regeneration of Europe itself. 
And specifically, Europe is looking in salvation within what they see as being the primitive. Now, in some cases, this refers to Europe's own pre-Christian past. In other cases, it's looking to what it sees as primitiveness within contemporary Africa and Asia. Now, these supposedly contained a greater sense of vitality than the stagnated aesthetics of Europe, according to many artists and intellectuals. Nothing perhaps reflects this embrace of primitivism as well as Pablo Picasso's proto-cubist work, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. And we're just going to take a quick look right now, but you can check out here if you're interested in more. The face of the two figures on the right are directly inspired by an exhibition that Picasso saw in Paris in 1907 when he painted his hugely influential work. Picasso found emotion and vitality and spirituality in African art that he believed could re-energize Western art. He particularly liked that African art did not try to emphasize naturalism or emphasize perspective or proportion or symmetry. And his deliberate rejection of these elements is apparent in his later works as well. Hey, what about those other faces in the painting? What influenced them? Okay, ancient Egypt and pre-Roman Iberia, but we don't have time for that right now. Picasso wasn't alone in finding inspiration from uh, what he called primitive cultures of Europe's past and other parts of the world. Ten years earlier, Paul Gauguin uh, painted his celebrated Where Do We Come From? one of several paintings done in remote Polynesia. And in 1913, Igor Stravinsky premiered his ballet The Rite of Spring, celebrating Russia's primitive past, and it led to riots. Uh, and there were many other works and artists. Admiration for simpler societies wasn't entirely new either. Uh, Michel Montaigne and William Shakespeare back in the 16th century had emphasized what they called the noble savage. And that tradition continued up until the 18th century and in North America as well as in Europe, as we can see in Benjamin West's painting, The Death of General Wolfe. But there was something different and more urgent about 20th century Paris's infatuation with primitive societies. Modern life, which had been greatly speeded up by industrialization, by urbanism, uh, made intellectuals, artists, and just normal people long for simpler times. Now, some, like Gauguin, escaped that life altogether physically. But there was also a longing for something new. Now, when Josephine Baker arrived in Paris, the most popular dance in all of Europe was the waltz. Are you kidding me? The waltz? The waltz? I mean, that dance hadn't been new since the 1780s to 1860s. So the Charleston, when it comes along, particularly the way that Josephine dances it, was a much needed breath of fresh air. And Paris, in a sense, had already been primed for Josephine's arrival. Because the Charleston came to Paris before Josephine with World War I and the arrival of American soldiers. And this is the first time that most Parisians experienced jazz live, and live black people as well. So what is it about Paris and France that captivated Josephine so? Well, if you've been there, you might not ask that question. I mean, what's not to like about warm croissants, the Louvre, Bateau Mouche along the Seine, Paris Disneyland? Oh wait, that wasn't there yet. And hey, that's not even French. Ah, that's better. Ah yes, much better, much better. Ah, now we're talking. Clichés are so much better than American cultural hegemony, don't you think? Anyway, leaving aside American stereotypes of France, for a young black woman, especially in the 1920s, Paris is a liberation from America's systemic racist oppression. And Josephine herself reflected this on, as one of her first impressions. Uh, last night after the show was over, the theater was turned into a big restaurant, and for the first time in my life, I was invited to sit at a table with white people. Now, these pictures from the fashionable club Chez Bricktop give some ideas of how naturally black people mixed with white people and were even served by them in 1920s Paris. In fact, this club itself was owned and run by this formidable black woman, Ada Bricktop Smith. And she performed at her club and as well as tended to clients, and she was even the bouncer at times. And this was the place to see and to be seen. France was by no means free of racism, but it felt a lot more welcoming and safer than anything Josephine had known before in the United States. And she didn't have to settle for just fitting in either. Much of her onstage extravagance expanded into real life, such as with her pet cheetah, or her chateau, or her alleged thousands of lovers who were male and female. 
Josephine was a megastar who was adored for who she was as an individual. And for the first time in her life, perhaps, white people saw her as beautiful in her blackness. They called her the Black Venus, the Black Pearl, the Bronze Venus, and the Creole Goddess. I seriously, kind of hard for that not to go to your head, right? Moving on, naturally Josephine was eager, as were producers, to cash in on her success with bigger projects. And she was a star of the 1927 silent film Siren of the Tropics. Now, it was a critical and a commercial flop, but it was also the first international film to feature a black person in a lead role. Josephine never became as much of a star of the screen as she was of the stage, but she did go on to star in lead roles in another couple of films, in 1934's Zuzu and in 1935's Princess Tam Tam. Now, none of these films are free of uh, colonialist, racialized fantasies and tropes, but they are still remarkable if you think about what black actors in the United States could expect at the time, or for that matter, for several decades forward. In France, not only did Josephine have cachet, but she starred in lead roles playing characters that actually had some depth. As a singer, she found greater and enduring success, especially with her song J'ai deux amours, uh, which was about her love for Paris and her country. And she also did well with critics and audiences with a revived comic opera called La Creole. None of this translated to success in the United States, however. She came home in 1936 uh, to star in the Ziegfeld Follies, but any hopes of a triumphant return were dashed by poor box office results and vicious personal attacks in the reviews. Black audiences certainly knew of her, of her glamour, of her wealth, of her celebrity, her style, and of the fact that by now she was fluent in French. She's a very uplifting image for black people, but clearly white mainstream audiences weren't yet ready for her. Naturally, Josephine was devastated, but she wasn't one to mope for long. And in 1937, back in Paris, she renounced her American citizenship when she married, for the third time, to Jean Lyon, a wealthy businessman and aviator. This, of course, gave her French citizenship. But feeling French wasn't just a matter of paper for Josephine. After 12 years of living in France and being allowed to be herself, being rewarded for it, in fact, her identification with France was emotional as well as legal. Soon, she had the chance to prove it. 